Welcome to Marincy First. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like more information about Marincy First, such as service times or ministry opportunities, feel free to check out facebook.com backslash Marincy AG or Marincy First at youtube.com. And two great ways to stay connected throughout the week is by hitting the subscribe button on our YouTube page. That way you'll be notified when something new is posted and by hitting like on our Facebook page. Thanks again for joining us today. Welcome home. Good morning. I'm so happy to be with you this morning. I'm so happy to see you this morning. And I know for a fact, um, Rochelle, you're crying already. <laughs> you can't do that to me because I'll start crying. Um, I am so happy to be with you this morning. And I know for a fact, I, I don't think Satan ever wants the word preached, but I am pretty sure he doesn't want the word preached this morning because he's been fighting me since yesterday. But um, he's not in charge. So... We're going to preach the word this morning, and um, I just want to pray first that God, God speaks and, and not me. So if you'll join me in praying this morning. Dear Lord, we just come to you this morning, God, and um, God, I just humbly ask that you just um, take over me, Lord, and that your words um, become my words, and that your voice is heard, God, in this place this morning. And that what you want each individual to hear, Lord, I pray that's what they hear. I pray that you speak to their heart exactly what they need this morning. I pray that um, they feel that um, you are indeed speaking straight to them, straight to their need, God, and straight to their um, struggles, straight to their triumphs, Lord, and straight just straight to their heart, God. You say that uh, your word is, is just so powerful, God, and we believe that this morning. We believe that uh, your word is truth, and we believe that it is the only sure truth in this world, God. We believe that we can hold it up as the standard against this world, Lord, and that it is the one and only standard. So, Lord, um, I just pray that you would um, truly be heard this morning, God, and we give you all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. And, God, I want to thank you, um, as always, not just for what you do for us, God, but for who you are, because truly, if you never did another thing for us, God, we would be um, just... You don't owe us anything. So if you didn't didn't do another thing for us, God, we would just be so incredibly indebted and grateful just for who you are, God, and uh, just for the fact that you died on the cross for us. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning I want to talk to you about um, our identity in Christ and Maybe go a little bit of a different way than you have heard in the past. Um, hopefully, it'll be a little bit different. Um, but as we do this, I want you to remember that uh, Satan cannot create anything. He can only pervert, distort, and destroy things. So not only did he not create you, um, but he does not create any kind of plan for your life. And he does not create uh, any kind of will for your life. Um, he is only there to pervert, distort, and destroy what God has created. So um, some of us had very happy childhoods, very um, healthy childhoods and upbringings and families. And then some of us had maybe dysfunctional um, families, and then some of us were maybe orphans, and we didn't grow up in a family. Um, some of us had healthy, positive, um, beautiful words spoken over us as we were growing up, and some of us had uh, words that were hurtful and painful spoken over us. God uses those words as we grow and become adults, and those words repeat themselves in our minds. 
He also uses the opinions of our friends and coworkers. Uh, everything that they say, if we're not careful, that will repeat itself in our mind. Um, as well as if we're married or if we have a significant other, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend, those opinions will repeat themselves over and over again in your mind, or our minds. Um, also, our culture, and this is maybe one of the most impactful, although I think um, your, what your parents say over you and what your spouse says over you are probably two of the most impactful things. But what our culture, and especially like our teenagers and our kids as they grow up, um, our culture is constantly selling things to us, you know, um, what girls should look like, what they should do, who they should be, same thing for guys. Sometimes I think we focus on girls a lot, but guys are under a lot of pressure as well. Uh, what they should do, what makes them a man, you know, uh, what, what makes them, you know, manly, um, and what makes them kind of wussy, you know. Um, that is sold to them day after day after day. And that's why it's so important as parents that we limit um, and we're careful about what influences we allow our children to listen to because we can speak those beautiful, wonderful, good, and healthy words over them when we see them at night and, you know, in the evenings and on the weekends and everything. But if all day long they're surrounded by a culture that is telling them something else, something negative, and putting those ungodly influences on them, we can only do so much when we're with them. You know, so it's our job also to do what we can do. There's a creek right here. I can stand here. Um, it's, it's our job to limit, um, you know, and we can't necessarily control every influence that they're around, you know, if they're at school or um, if they have jobs or, you know, we can't necessarily control everything that they're around. But we can certainly um, limit um, their access to social media or how much time they spend on social media or what kind of social media they're on all the time. Um, or we can monitor their social media. We can monitor what music they listen to. And I was going to play you guys um, a song. And then my husband was like, I don't know if they're ready for that. But there's a song... <laughs> called um, Spiritual Sniper by Z. Have any of you heard that? It's a Christian song. Have any of you heard that? Nathaniel, I'm so disappointed in you. Okay, you need to listen to it. Um, any of our teenagers who are not here this morning, really? All right, my kids listen to it, um, whether they want to or not, because I'm playing it constantly. But it's by Z, like Z-E-E. -E. And there's actually really good, Mikey, I'm seriously disappointed in you. Um, there's actually um, really good, like, rap music, Christian rap music out there. And the words, some of the words are so amazing and incredible. I'm like, wow, like, if, if people, like, stopped and listened to these words, um, but Spiritual Sniper is awesome. Y'all need to go home and Google it. And you might want to keep it low if you're not into rap music. But um, you will, if you drive by the parsonage, you will hear it, like, booming out of the parsonage. And it is Christian rap, but uh, it's awesome. It's awesome. And no, it's not about, like, taking guns to abortion clinics or anything like that. It is really, really good. But the name is Spiritual Sniper. And I expect you all to know it by next Sunday. We're going to sing it during worship. Lance is going to play it. And y'all are going to sing it, okay? I expect you to know all the words. And it goes really, really fast. You have to, like, be a rapper, okay? So, but it's awesome. Um, but there, there is, you can, you can, your teen, my point is, is your teenager can still listen to rap music, but it doesn't have to be about, you know, killing cops and, you know, their mom and their dad and whatever. And I know not all rap music is about that, but I'm telling you some of it is. Some of it's about the exact stuff you don't want your kids listening to. Um, so you should be aware of what they're listening to. Um, so I think we covered influences by spouses, you know, parents, friends, 
um, our culture, coworkers. Um, and then Satan uses our thoughts, and we all know this. Um, Satan can just put a completely demonic thought in your mind or just something that you would never, ever, ever think or do. He can just put it in your mind. And at that point, if he puts that thought in your mind out of nowhere, um, you haven't sinned. But if you, you know, if you say, God, I don't know what that was, but no, I'm not dwelling on that. You know, please forgive me for thinking that. And then you move on. You haven't sinned. But if you dwell on that thought and you start, you know, continuing to think about that, you know, at that point you're sinning. Does that make sense? So, you know, Satan, he'll put thoughts in your mind. He'll put temptations in your mind. Um, what you do with those thoughts is what makes a difference if you sin or not. So um, he also puts thoughts to shame us. And God, there's a difference between, as we've talked about before, conviction and condemnation. Conviction will always be to make you better. It will always be, the, the goal will always be to bring you into a re right relationship with Jesus so that then you can go forward and be better. It will never be to make you feel like the scum of the earth and leave you there. That's how, that's how you know the difference. You know, one leads you to Jesus and one doesn't. So um, like, an, like an example of um, condemnation would be if you are struggling with drugs and you have these thoughts like, I'm never going to be able to overcome this addiction. I'm never going to get clean. That, that's not conviction. That's condemnation. Conviction would be, I have to get clean. I can't live like this. I'm hurting myself and my family. I need to get help. That's conviction, you know, or um, I, I cannot keep drinking. I, there's no way my marriage is going to survive this, and I know this isn't what God wants for me. That's conviction. You know, condemnation would be, you know, my dad was an alcoholic. You know, he never got, he never got clean, and there's just, I can't do anything about it. You know, this is just the way my family is, you know, or whatever. Does that make sense? So there's a big difference. Um, and then there's a tool that Satan uses where you become his free employee. So once he can get you to believe something, then he likes to hire you for free. And what that is is he gets you to believe something, and then he gets you to go around and get other people to believe it. So um, that would be... Like, you not only drink, but now you get your buddies to drink with you. Or you have a complaint about church, but now instead of having a complaint and grumbling about it, but you don't come and talk to pastor, you just grumble about it. But now you're like, oh, I'm going to tell some other people. And you go around and tell other people and stir, you know, up something. Or at work. You know, like you have a complaint, and instead of, like, grumbling about it and not talking it through with your supervisor or whoever you need to talk it through with and trying to come to a resolution, you're like, I'm just going to go talk to people about it, you know, and you go and you talk to other people about, about it. That's, like, working for the enemy for free, you know, because it's not only letting him put thoughts in your mind and stir up trouble, but now you're going to go affect other people. So, um, so why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because we are not called to live like that. We are not called to have our identity or our lives run by Satan. So if you can turn to me, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. 
And if you can, if you're able to, if you'll stand with me for the reading of God's word. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And Lord, we just ask God once again that you just bless your word, that your word would go forth. God, you said that your word goes forth and it does not return void. God, we trust that. We trust everything that you say. God, so we know that you will use this for your glory. In Jesus' name, thank you that we are a chosen people, that we are your people. Thank you, God, for choosing us, for dying for us, God. And Lord, you say that um, all we have to do is ask you into our hearts and realize that you died on the cross for us and accept you, and we become your chosen people. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you look at the scripture and you look at what Peter says we are, um, so Peter wrote this. And he named it after himself. No, uh, this is First Peter and Second Peter. <laughs> he wrote, but um, he says that we are chosen, um, that we are the royal priesthood, that we are holy, that we are God's people, or um, a different translation says a people belonging to God, and that we've received mercy. So, those are pretty exciting titles you know, for us to be called, for, for that to be our identity. Um, and I'm going to break it down a different way in just a second. But um, first, we are chosen. This is we are completely accepted. And I think we've all been in a situation where, like, we go into a room and everybody knows, is this mine or is this yours? Okay, we're married, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I'll take anything of his I want. I'm going to get it all over there. I'm going to, mm, I wear his clothes at home, y'all. It makes him so mad. I wear all his PJs. Then he goes to wear his PJs, and he doesn't have any PJs. I'm like, you can wear mine. And he's like, no, thank you. Because it doesn't, it doesn't work the same way. It's not quite as exciting. Is it, Tony? Are you wearing his PJs yet? No, not yet. It's coming. It's coming, Luke. It's coming. Um, so anyway, now I forgot what I was going to say. Okay. Okay, so we've all been to that party or that event or whatever where we don't know anybody, you know, and everybody else knows everybody. And so you're trying to act like you don't care and you're super excited about, like, the drink you have or the little appetizer you have or, you know, whatever. And um, you're really into it. And I was reading a book um, the other day, and it was kind of funny, she was describing that situation this lady was, and she was saying that um, she was going to go talk to, like, the the server that was, like, serving the punch or whatever, and she thought up all these things she was going to say to him to, like, ha make the conversation continue to happen, you know, like, go, so it looked like she was in a conversation since she didn't know anybody else at the party. So she, like, spent, like, all this time, like, okay, I'm going to talk to him about this and this and this and this. And she walked up to him, and the first thing, she said, hi. And he's like, hi. And he, like, gave her the punch, and then he turned around, and he left, you know. And she's like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, I can't even talk to, like, the punch boy or whatever. But um, we've all been in that situation where we don't feel accepted, you know. Um, and sometimes the situation's way worse than being alone at a party when there's a room full of people. But God has accepted us, flaws and all. No matter what we've done, we are accepted. No matter who we are, what we've done, no matter if we feel like we're the odd person out um, or, you know, we feel like we don't fit into our own family, 
um, we are always accepted by Jesus. You know, he loved us so much, he died on the cross for us. And not only are we accepted by him, but you have to think about it like this. He created you, so he chose exactly what you look like. You know, so if you have brown hair, he chose that. If you need glasses, he chose that. You know, if you have dark skin, he chose that. If you have small ears, he chose that. If you have big ears, he chose that. Big lips, small lips, whatever your, your characteristics are, he made that. He chose that. So it's an acceptance like we'll never know. Even you, Jerry, it's an acceptance. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Even, but it's an acceptance like, you know, we, we'll never know from, from anyone else because he, there's no one else in the world that accepts us to that level because he actually created that. So, and we find um, him saying that in Ephesians uh, 1, 4, which I'm going to turn to real quick. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So Ephesians 1, 4 is the scripture reference if you want to mark that down. And then we also find that we are extremely valuable. We, and this is, goes with the fact that we're holy, a people belonging to God. And if you look at Isaiah chapter 43, I'm super quick at finding things in my Bible. No, I'm just kidding. I marked everything. I have little sticky notes because I'm not super quick. I'm like, I don't want to be up there, and I can't find anything. Then you guys will think I never read my Bible. And I still can't get to it with a sticky note on it. Okay, um, Isaiah 43, and I'm just going to kind of read a little bit because I, I love this chapter. Um, Isaiah 43, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes. And honored. And I love you. There's no better I love you than when it comes from Jesus. When we say I love you, we can mean it with everything in us, but still we only know a finite version of love because we only know the love that we've learned or been shown or are capable of. But God is love. He's the very definition of love. So when he says, I love you, he means it in a way that not only can we not say that kind of love because we don't know love that deep, but he's saying, when he says, I love you, he's saying it in a way that we can't even comprehend. So when he says, I love you, he's saying, I love you in a way that I will never even know 
the meaning of that. So you know when we write something to somebody and we say, like I'll say it to my mom or I'll say it to Josh, I'll say, you know, I love you, you know, more than you'll ever know or I love you more than words can ever express. That might be true, but God truly loves us more than we will ever know and more than words can ever express. So, I mean, it's like we'll never know, never know the depths of that, you know, until we get to heaven, you know. When we get to heaven, then we will know. And that's why our loved ones that have gone on to heaven, you know, we, we truly really grieve for ourselves. You know, truly that's who we're grieving for because if we really knew the love that they're experiencing and the life that they are living, because they are living with Jesus, we wouldn't shed a tear for them. And I know we say, oh, but I'm, you know, grieving for what they're missing out on here. And I, I've said the same thing, you know, like I'm grieving for what my dad's missing out on, not seeing my children grow up and not seeing me, you know, and I'm, and I'm grieving for what Ethan's missing out on, you know. And I say that and I feel okay saying, like I, I, don't, I'm, I don't think I'm wrong saying that because I think God understands. I know he does. But it's because I only can understand things in my finite level of thinking. I still can only understand things from an earthly perspective. And God knows that, and he understands that. So he's like, he's probably thinking, it's okay, Brian, it's okay. Like, you can say that, because that's all you know, you know. But one day you will get here, and you'll understand that, your dad and Ethan didn't miss out on anything. So. And also 1 Corinthians 7.23 tells us we were bought with a price. And of course, you know, there are so many scriptures in the Bible. You know, we talk about John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that, who, forever, who, that whosoever shall believe in him, shall have eternal life, but there are so many scriptures in the Bible that talk about how he died for us. Um, but 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7, 23, um, if you want a scripture that literally says that we were bought with a price, or bought for a price. And then we are eternally loved which we kind of just talked about. But in Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And we talked about how it's unconditional and unending. So there is nothing we can do to make God love us any more or any less. So we do things for God and we serve God because we love him it's because we love him, but it's not to make him love us more. I got some of it stuck on there for you. Um, so we, that's why we serve God. We serve God because we love him. We serve him strictly because we love him and we want to obey him. We want to... Um, we want to serve him. We want to, we want when we get to heaven to, you know, when we serve him down here, when we get up to heaven one day, you know, he says that we're going to have jewels, you know, in this crown that we then get to lay at his feet, you know, lay at Jesus' feet. And so we're serving him here because for starters, we want to bring as many people to heaven as we can with us. So we're serving him because we want to tell other people about Jesus. We want to share this Savior with people. You know, we want to share this incredible God that loves like no one loves and that 
we're going to be with for eternity. But, you know, because we're serving him, we're going to have these jewels when we get to heaven that we're going to put in this crown. It's kind of surreal when you think about it, when you talk about it. It's almost, it's, it's surreal to think that there's this real place that we're going to go to. This isn't some fantasy movie, cartoon, you know, whatever. This is a real place that we're going to go to. And we really get to do this. We really get to put jewels in a crown and we really get to lay it at Jesus's feet. You know, sometimes it, you have to remind yourself that this life is just the prologue. You know, the, the I think last time I talked to you guys, I talked about how you know, our life is like a book and this, and the real, our real story, our real book, our real life is up in heaven. And this, this earthly life is just like the prologue, you know? Um, but it's like, we're going to earn these jewels here that when we get to heaven and we're living our real life, we get to lay down this crown in front of our savior and be like, I have nothing to give you because you created everything you have everything you need you know god doesn't need anything from us you know so basically we're going to say i i have nothing to give you except my love for you which is demonstrated by these jewels in this crown because these jewels represent things I did on earth out of my love for you. You know, because I loved you, I did these things. And, you know, I don't have anything that you need. I don't have anything to give you except to say, I love you, Jesus. And I hope you can see by these jewels that I wanted to show you how much I love you, you know? So um, it's, it's, it's kind of surreal to think that, you know, but it's an, what an honor we're gonna have to be able to do, to do that. That there's nothing you can do to make him love you more and there's nothing you can do to make him love you less. But when we do something that dishonors him and we stray away from him, it's not that he loves us less, but he can't be involved in sin. He can't, he can't, he's so holy that he cannot be in relationship with sin. So we have to make ourselves right again. We have to stop that sin and ask for forgiveness because he can't, he's so holy that he can't be in relationship with sin. So we've got to make it right. And then we are completely forgiven. So when God forgives us, he doesn't sit there and rehearse our sin over and over again. He doesn't sit there and, you know, kind of sometimes with your spouse, like you're supposed to forgive them and let it go. But, and you do until the next time they do something. And then you're like, remember last time when you did that? Or last time when you did, it, when you did anything? Like, Remember last time when you, you didn't clean the microwave out and, you know, like it doesn't have anything to do with like what you're currently arguing about, you know? So like we tend to forgive until it suits us to bring something back up. You know, that's like our human nature and we have to kind of keep working on that and try, keep trying to get better, you know, at forgiving completely and letting things go completely because, because we're human. But God doesn't have to do that. When God forgives, he forgives. And I like to point out, it's not that he's stupid. It's not that he really forgets. You know, he doesn't forgive and forget. Like, I don't know, my husband and I, I don't know, we just like to explain this. It's not like he does not know that you sinned. It's that he chooses to separate that sin, you know, as far from you as the East is from the West. And he chooses to say, you know, he chooses not to remember 
It's not that he gets amnesia and, you know, just like, oh, I don't know that happened. It's because of his great love for us that he chooses not to remember it. So I heard somebody say, God, and I thought this was so good. Um, God does not rehearse our sin. He releases it, which I thought was super good. And then because of all of these things that we talked about that 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 says, because we're chosen and we're holy and we're a people belonging to God and we've received mercy, because of these things, we are part of the royal priesthood. So that means that it's actually like you're actually, your job is to go out and minister. You are part of the royal priesthood, so your job is to actually go out and open the eyes of those around you to our Savior, to how great he is, to how wonderful it is to have a relationship with him. Um, it's not just your pastor's job to spread the gospel. It's your job as well. Because you know how wonderful Jesus is. You know how wonderful God is. So you're sitting with that information. You're sitting with that knowledge. And God has called you to spread that. So if you'll turn with me to Acts 26, 18. And this is our last verse that we're going to cover. And if you back up, like, right before 2618, a few words before, it says, to whom I am sending you, and then it says, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And that's Jesus talking there. So... Literally, you are, when it comes to your identity, like we talked about how you're holy, you know, all of these things, you're a people belonging to God, you know, but you're also part of the royal priesthood. So you literally have been commissioned by Jesus, and there's plenty of other scriptures that say this as well, but you have literally been commissioned by Jesus to go and spread the gospel, to tell people about him. You know, that is your identity. Um, and then kind of going in a little bit of a different direction with that um, and what God kind of spoke to me last week, and I was like, okay, how do I fit this in here? Um, Sometimes I think we get caught up in our, maybe our role in life or in our position at work or our position in life and we forget our basic identity. And so um, what I mean by that, and this is where it's kind of hard for me to explain, so I'm going to try to do it. And I'm going to try to do it as quick as I can. I packed a lunch. Did you all pack a lunch? You did? Okay. That's okay. I got you covered. I, I, got a, I have a brown bag lunch. It's got fish and loaves in it. I'm going to ask Jesus to bless it. It's going to feed 5,000. We're good to go. Okay. That was a joke. You all need to laugh. I'm going to wake up and laugh. Okay. I actually was going to bring, I actually was going to bring a brown bag. And I was going to bring, like, stuff in it. And I was going to, like, pull out an apple. And I was going to be like, did you guys pack your lunch? But I ran out of time. So. Thank you to my daughter, by the way, for helping me get ready this morning. It was a rough morning. So she was so sweet. Okay. Um, so quick backstory because I'm looking around. How many of you were here when I preached on Mother's Day? Okay. All right, so I know there's some new faces, so I'm going to do like a quick, real quick backstory, okay? All right, so, um, so 
So Pastor Josh and I have been pastoring for like 20 years. And um, we were like youth pastors for three years. And then we became senior pastors like 17 years ago. And um, we were trucking along and everything. And then uh, we lost our son, Ethan, um, 12 years ago. And we still just kept going. You know, I mean, we really, we didn't miss a Sunday. We should have missed a Sunday. We're very, um, like it's a miracle really that we're as healthy as we are, to be honest, with our grief because we should have missed some time. We should have, you know, taken some time. Um, but we just, we kept ministering. Um, and then... But we grieved along the way, you know. Um, but God, I think God has really used our, our grief and our son's story. And um, he's used, you know, just we've met so many people who have lost children. And also so many people who have lost children, like in the womb, who, who had never um, felt the permission, I guess. I hate to say that word, but that's what they felt. They had never felt the permission to even name their babies. So we had also had three miscarriages, and we had named all our babies. And so, but I think Ethan really brought out, uh, he was three months old, and it really, you know, we were publicly grieving a lot. Like, we had never hidden our miscarriages, and we, miscarriages, and we had grieved them as well. But I don't know, Ethan's story just seemed to touch people, and it just, there were a lot of conversations and ministry opportunities that came out of that, and a lot of people felt, the permission, like I said, I hate that word, but that's what they felt to like name their babies for the first time. And, um, some really, um, awesome, you know, God worked in some awesome ways. Right. So then that brings us to like, so he passed away in 2010. So then in 2015, I was teaching vacation Bible school and I, um, and I'm going to not give details because it'll take too long. So I'm just going boom, boom, boom. But in 2015, I was teaching vacation Bible school. Um, it was a week long thing. And halfway through the week, I went home. I felt fine. Um, I mean, I was exhausted, but I went home. I went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, I woke up in agony, like my whole body in agony. And we didn't know what was wrong. But my whole body just was in agony. And the next day, I felt like I was in labor, and but I was not pregnant. And so um, he took me to the doctor, and they said it was a virus, and I would be better by Monday. This was like Friday, Thursday or Friday. And um, by that weekend, I was having breathing issues, like heart symptoms and everything. So... I've had all kinds of testing. All they know is it's an autoimmune disease, but they don't know what kind. And I, so I've been sick ever since, like, and just gotten sicker and sicker. I've had some strokes, you know, that they found out I had a hole in my heart. I've had that, you know, I have a closure. I have a device that closes it. So it's been a really just rough road medically for me since 2015. So I used to be a super involved pastor's wife. And I think that became my identity. And y'all, I haven't talked to my husband about this, so that's why I'm a little bit like nervous. I never talked to him about anything, but no, I'm just, <laughs> he's always nervous when I have the microphone, I think, because he's like, oh my gosh, what is she gonna say now? Um, no, but he and I just trust each other. He, I mean, we, he just, he doesn't clear everything with, before I say it, and I don't clear everything before. We just trust each other, I, and we've never had a problem. Right, babe? <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, I'm just saying, I think, you know, I was always so involved, and I think that became my identity. And... I'm also a homeschooling mom. You know, I'm a stay-at-home mom, and I always have been. I gave up working. Um, I was the sole breadwinner 
for the first nine months of our marriage <laughs> while he finished college. And then I, I basically gave up working, you know. And I'm the part-time secretary here now, but, um, but basically, you know, I'm a stay-at-home, you know, homeschooling mom. And, um, but I used to be just a very involved, you know, pastor's wife, super involved. And I've been more sick here than I've ever been anywhere. And I've been less, been able to be less involved. I mean, you see, I'm not even always here, you know. And um, it hurts super bad. But I'm just saying, I think it became, I think I allowed it to become my identity. And God's been working with me on that, you know. And saying, you know, that's not your identity, you know. You're Brian, you know. And I love you as Brian. And if you were never an involved pastor's wife again, I would love you. Thank you. I would love you just the same. You know? Because the thing is, is we don't have to earn his love. And all we have to do is be obedient. So, that doesn't mean that I get a free pass, that I don't have to do anything for him. But it just means that every day, I do what he asks me to do in that day. So, I, from the time I was, you know, born, or whatever, from the time I can remember, I've always loved to write. I wrote my first book at like in like kindergarten or second grade or something. And you know, I've I've always loved to write, always. And I always thought I would write a book and I've written tons of partial books and um I wrote like a children's book in high school and I wrote but I wrote I used to write for our new I wrote a newspaper column when we were when when Emily was like a year old, I wrote a newspaper column for the town we lived in, and I loved it. Um, but you know, God's told me. You know, God told me He's like, like there's there's certain gifts that God's given us, given each of us. You know, and there's there's certain things that are intrinsic to who we are, and. That's always been intrinsic to who I am. I've always expressed myself through writing, you know, and after Ethan died, I started a blog and, you know, I gave it up. Just, I was so busy when I was pregnant with Julia and, I was on bed rest, but I was busy. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but but I just, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I'm saying, God, God's like, I can use you. Like I felt, like I stopped journaling. I stopped writing. I stopped. I stopped letting him use me. in a way that I know he uses me. I think because I just kind of gave up. I don't know, I think because I kind of was like, I'm sick, you know, like I can't be the pastor's wife I need to be, and I can't, I don't know. 
I might be trying to explain something I'm not totally sure about myself yet, you know, but I do know that we don't have to earn God's love. And I, last week, I know that he wanted me to talk to you about examining yourself and thinking fully about, you know, who we are in Christ, like the things we talked about today, but then also separating yourself from, like who we are in Christ isn't necessarily necessarily the roles that we've put on ourselves. You know, you might have a role that, a job that you do or a role that you do, but that's not necessarily who you are in Christ, who God's called you to be. And you don't have to earn God's love. So if you can't do that role right now, or you feel like you're failing in that role, or you feel like you're not doing it as well as you should be, that doesn't mean that you, you've lost your identity in Christ, you know? Or maybe you need to take a step back and say, what is it that God is really calling me to do? And is this role that I'm doing, is it getting in the way? You know, now me being a pastor's wife is something I long, you know, I love being. And I long for the day that I can be more involved and I pray so much. I We went to the pastor and spouse renewal, you know, last month and um, Laura Sains, you know, the former pastor's wife here, she prayed over me again along with another woman and when they prayed, I had a vision. I saw this black, um, oily substance, this black, like slimy, oily substance come off of me in pieces. I saw it. And I, I, I shared that. And everybody was like, oh, you're healed, you're healed, you know? And I, I did take it as me being healed. I mean, that's how I felt. And you know, we, we, we praised God, you know, um, our district superintendent were there, you know, and, um, all the other pastors in the network and we all praised God and agreed, you know, and we're like, we're going to walk out of here in, in, in agreement that I'm healed. And, um, I told pastor, I was hurting, but I told him, I said, I'm not going to take my medicine. I'm going to try to hold out and just, I'm going to believe that I'm healed and I'm not going to take my medicine. And y'all, I made it 12 hours and I hurt so bad the whole time. But I made it 12 hours and I just couldn't do it anymore, you know. And pastor said, you can take your medicine, it's okay, you know. And, but I, I, I didn't want to, you know, but I finally, I did. You know, after 12 hours, I just, I hurt so bad. So we still don't know what, what is the deal, you know. It's like, okay, God, you know, we've prayed so many times and thought I was healed. What is the deal? You know, but maybe he still has things for me to learn. You know, because he obviously had to teach me that, you know, I can't make being a pastor's wife my identity. So maybe he still has things to teach me, you know. So I'll be obedient to whatever he wants because he loves me in a way that I don't even understand because he loves me that much. And he loves you that much. And I cry every time I get up here. You know that? Every time. Oh my gosh, I, I can get up here for, and do announcements and I feel like I cry when I'm up here. But, but anyway, he loves you guys that much. He loves you that much, you know? And I hope something that I said made sense. It maybe did until I started talking. <laughs> um, but the 
that make kind of does it kind of make sense? Okay. All right. Um, will you all come up to the altar for me, and we can pray together. Lance, do you mind coming up? Are you okay? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you hurting? And let me just say, y'all are the best church. You're the most patient people. You're so patient with me. And y'all always say, I'm so glad you're here. You know, even if I'm late, you know, and you say, you know, you're so sweet. You're like, even if you're here after church or for five minutes, we're just so glad you're here. You're the best church. You're so understanding and so sweet. I love you guys so much. You're so sweet. Who paid you? Who paid you to say that? Did my mama pay you? This is my mama right here. And her husband, Don. I'm so glad to have him here today. Um, so, I'd like to just close in prayer and just, um, if you can just kind of talk to God, you know, and just ask him if he has anything he wants to say to you today. And then at the back door... I have a little thing for you. I have, because I know you guys like to color. I have, do y'all remember when I gave the kids a crayon, a red crayon? Do y'all remember that? Okay. So I have a white crayon for y'all so you don't feel left out. Um, but no, I want you to put this somewhere. Um, you can put it like in your, dresser drawer with your clothes or wherever you want to put it but um, just put it in an unexpected place um, just almost like a place that you would forget it's there just kind of bury it somewhere but a place that you might come across it in the next you know a little bit don't like hide it too well but I want you to come across it unexpectedly. And when you come across it, I just want you to hopefully remember your identity in Christ. When we ask him into our hearts and he forgives us of our sins. And he takes away everything. It is dirty and nasty and unholy and he makes us pure and holy and his people and he calls us his own I think that's one of the most beautiful names that he could call us is when he says we are his own So I just want you to come across it unexpectedly and remember your identity in Christ. Because when we break it down, it has nothing to do with our role in life or who we used to be. It really has nothing to do with us at all, but it has everything to do with him. And he says that we are his own. So I'm going to pray out loud. And if you just want to pray, you know, just you and God. And then Lance, if you'll just close.